I just want to reiterate <clears throat> this, the central theme of last week's um, session, which revolved around wa allama adam al asma akullaha, and we taught, but it isn't just we taught. We there is a great degree of emphasis upon the fact that we taught. It wasn't just, yeah, it was just a transmission of knowledge. But there is an exaggeration in the manner of speaking. And we established last time that Allah Azza wa Jal imparts knowledge through discourse. And that discourse is mentioned in another verse of the Qur'an, مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهِ It is not for any man to talk to Allah إِلَّا وَحِيًّا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحِجَابِ Except through wahi or behind a curtain أَوْ يُرْسِلَ رسول Or through a messenger, I, a, 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 an angel. These are three words, three mechanisms through which Allah communicates. When the word مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ is used, it doesn't refer to any, excuse the expression, Tom, Dick or Harry, to pick this verse up and say, well, this applies to me. It is in relation to prophets. Ma kana li basharin. Any bashar. Bashar means body and soul. It does not refer to soul on its own. So the communication is, to th- is three ways. Wahiyan, and I've come up with a, 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 a new expression to, for you to understand what is wahi. Because when we use the word wahi, there's a vagueness around it. What is wahi? What actually happens in wahi? Of course, the hadith explains it in the context of uh, when wahi came, it was like ringing bells. <coughs> The best way to understand wahi is telepathy. Telepathy or telepathy, whatever you want to pronounce it. It does not require the usage of audible language. It is revealed. And in the mind of a prophet, when a wahi is revealed, there is no shadow of doubt that this inspiration is not my thought, it's not the thought of shaitan, because it cannot be, uh, it cannot be infiltrated. When a non-prophet receives wahi, or ilqa as we call it, that is subject to infiltration. But whether it is infiltrated or not, anyone who is a non-prophet, even if he or she was to receive wahi, which we call ilqa, just so that we don't mix the two, that cannot have legal value. It cannot. So, if I have a dream that you must uh, do X, and I'm sure that that is ilqa to me, that has no legal value. But when a prophet is the recipient of wahi, that has legal value. I'm just going to park this point aside, because I want to come to this point. There's a lot of meat on this bone. Let's just quickly revisit the verse. Allah talks in three ways. Wahi, telepathy. It's the best way to understand it. So, it's inspiration. Words are inspired. Yeah? The second is curtain. So there is audible conversation. But in that audible conversation, what you have to understand, the one who was the premier of this audible conversation was a personality by the name of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. But even in that audible conversation, 
Angels were present, Jibreel was present, and he heard. I'm just planting some seeds, and when I connect the dots, you'll see where I'm going with this. Angels heard the conversation. It wasn't exclusive. On the top of the mountain, Musa -Islam heard Allah, but at the bottom of the mountain, Samiri and Harun -Islam and the rest, they didn't hear. So it was uh, the audibility was tuned to the ears of Musa -Islam and not to non-humans or uh, to humans. Yet angels were present. And they heard. Musa -Islam heard the discourse. Yeah, he heard the discourse. Um, in the event of a messenger, as in a uh, an angel coming. In the event of an angel coming, anything that is transmitted, well, the angel is privy to it, isn't he? So last time we established that wa allama Adam al asma kullaha. How did this allama take place? This knowledge process take place? Let me just recap because it's very important. When did this happen chronologically? Did this happen to Adam al Islam when he was spiritually alive? Because his spiritual existence predates this. We need to get the chronology right. I'm not going to go through the stages in which the body of Adam al Islam was created. The Quran actually graphically describes stages. When we come on to that in Surah Araf, we'll talk about that in more detail. The stages. It wasn't just a case of, right, just put the mud together, you know, and off you go. No. There were, it was almost like there were different stages uh, uh, to that. You know, th th there was the stage of mud, slime, there was the stage of baking, there were different stages. But the essential components of the physicality of Adam salam consisted of two elements. It consisted of two elements, two uh, 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 specific elements. Number one, the physical body was taken from four corners of the earth. There's a hadith on this that Allah sent an angel on the earth and he commanded the angels to take four pieces of earth. So the earth is divided into four parts. We find from that distinction. That distinction is helpful when we look at the, the Ghas and the Qutb and the Abdals, four corners of the earth, four parts of the earth. So the angel came and as he was about to execute the command of Allah, the earth started crying. Now, the hadith is very graphic in this. If you were to suggest that the earth cried, again, you would successfully qualify for NHS help for psychiatric or psychological assistance. Because how can the earth cry? The earth and its language and its personality is hidden to science. Science can't understand it. Science is only understanding plants now. Only just about understanding plants that, yeah, there's a life there. When you talk to a plant, it makes a difference. It's only just, you know, beginning to understand that. The earth cried and said to the angel, Don't take me. So it knew what it was being taken for. Don't take me. This is Hadith. Don't take me. I don't want to burn in hell. So can you see the foresight and the insight of the earth? How knowledgeable this mother earth is. It's not just something we walk on. It's very intelligent. And when you come to the world of science, we look at intelligent design. The earth is a very intelligent uh, uh, entity. Don't take me. It speaks to the angel. So there is a conversation with the angel. Don't take me for I don't want to be in hell. So it has so much knowledge that when my entity will be used to create the human being, this human being or a certain part of this population of human beings will go to hell and I don't want to go to hell. Yet, even if the earth, even if the earth ended up in hell on the auspices of those you know, inmates of hell, it wouldn't be a source of punishment for the earth. It's just, you know, why would the earth be punished for a crime that it hasn't committed? Do you see? 
The Quran says, La tazilu waziratan vizra ukhra. No soul will bear the weight of another. So the soul won't go to, but it's just, I don't want to go there. You know, we say, oh, I don't want to go there. And it's not about, you know, I will be punished there. I, I, don't, I don't want, you know. Or you tell your children, don't go to such and such a place. It's like, you know, not that you'll be harmed, but it's just, you, you don't want to go there. And the angel responded, and this response of an angel shows that angels have emotions. As some tafsir writers say, that humans possess emotions. Tawahamat. <laughs> humans possess this uh, uh, idea of uh, emotional and sentimentality. That is wrong. The angel, if you allow me to use this word, got sucked into this emotional saga pleaded by the earth. Don't take me. So he went empty handed to, uh, handed to Allah. And yet it was the order of Allah, go to the earth and get... He said, oh Allah, when I went to do my job, the earth pleaded to me, so I couldn't do my job. Allah didn't punish that angel. Allah said, fine. I understand the sentiment. I understand the sentiment. Then another angel went. Same thing happened. Allah didn't punish that angel. How dare you not do what I said? No. Allah appreciates sentiments. And he could have cut the chase, but no, a number of angels went, and they all came back empty-handed, until one... Called Israel. The angel of death went. Oh yes. Bailiffs have no emotions. They they are they are there to do their job. I'm sorry. When the angel when the earth pleaded with uh, uh, Israel Salam, Israel Salam said, Look, I understand where you're coming from, but I've got a job to do. And some say it was because of his demeanor at that juncture that he was given the post of Malakul Maut, the angel of death. That don't let your emotions interfere with your job. That's what bailiffs you know, normally have to deal with. Is, Look, I understand your position, but I've got a job to do. You, you understand that language? If you have had encounters with bailiffs, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, 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 the Malakul Maut went... And he took four pieces of the earth. So it wasn't as simple as, right, we've got the four pieces of earth, right now what? No. In that mix, there was water, because naturally mud on its own requires water, uh, water to, to construct. But the water did not come from earth. The water, according to these, came from Jannah. So every one of us in our construction has an element of Jannah. Yeah. If you allow me to quote Hazrat Sultan Bahu, where he says, Nakar minnat khaj khizardi. You know, people, there are some Sufis, they spend their whole life looking for Hazrat Khizr Islam. Why? Not because they want to meet him necessarily, although that's a nice perk. The real reason is, if we meet him, we're going to say, Dear Hazrat Khizr, can you tell us where that water is? Which you drink and which reflect with that fish, that barbecued fish. Yes, when it went into water, flipped back into life. We want to know where that water is. Can you tell us, please? So that water is called Abe Hayat, the water of life. So uh, people pursue the company of Khizr al-Islam to find Abe Hayat, the water of life. And as a Sultan Bahu says, Nakar minnat khaj khizardi, khaj min khaja. Nakar minnat khaj khizardi, tere andar ab hayati hu. That water you're looking for is inside you. Why? Because the water of Jannah has the property of Jannah. And what is the property of Jannah? Eternity. So we are, on the face of it, mortal or immortal? We have the capacity to be immortal. But the only way we will have capacity... Now you understand why awliya and anbiya in their graves are preserved. It's not because of embalming. It's the capacity to be immortal, which renders their body immune from the elements. That water dominates. The water of eternity dominates their body. And that's why shuhada and awliya are preserved in their grave. I've gone on a slight voyage of discovery here. So Adam was water from heaven, 
mud from earth. And then you have in front of you a statue. And then Allah says, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ We blew, and be careful with this translation. It can, if misunderstood, amount to shirk. وَنَفَخْتُ We blew into it. Fihi in it, in what? In the statue of Adam alayhi salam. Fihi what? Mirruhi from our soul. That's why Adam alayhi salam is Ruhullah. Adam uh, 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 is also Ruhullah. So we blew, but that blowing is not the way me and you blow. Because Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. Allah is not penetrable or Allah is not subtractable. So when we say Mirruhi from his soul, he blew min, and just not note these words, min ruhi from my soul, Allah says. I blew into it from ruhi, my soul. We cannot say it in the same that the same way we understand it. As in I say, I will give you uh, uh, food from my uh, uh, stock. That's not the same. It's mirruhi, the word min here will be a, 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 a majaz, which means from the baraka of my own soul. No creation up to now has had the privilege of that direct contact with me, me, the creator. But you are the first, O Adam, my soul, and the baraka of my soul is in you. Not that my soul is, you are part of me. Or I am part of you. No, not. It's not in any way that you are. Isko thoda sa man kar de, halka kar de. Isi ki awaz hai na? Nee, I think pipework. Pipework? Or maybe possibly uh, interference. So mirruhi from my soul. We will do tawil there, and we will read min from as majaz. Majaz means we won't apply the natural meaning of the word min. We will say from Allah as in a part of Allah. So if Adam is mirruhi and that's not shirk, then how can it be when we say about the Prophet nurim min nurillah, he is light from the light of Allah. Or where he says, he says, ma khalaq Allahu nuri, Allah created me from his nur. So again, there, the, those who pronounce shirk, they say, oh, this is shirk, from Allah's light. No, min here is majaz. So, um, Adam alayhi salam was given that privilege of having that direct link with Allah. That direct link with Allah. Um, and he, therefore, had the first, uh, 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 um, that, that, that privilege belonged to him. So when did Allama take place? Before the breathing of the soul or after the breathing of the soul? After. The soul itself contains immense amount of hidden knowledge. But here, I cover this point because I'd, some people think that this was a spiritual affair where he was his soul was enlightened remember last week we talked about lucy the brain was functioning at a hundred percent it had the capacity to accommodate the vastness of knowledge that overbared the power and knowledge of angels that's how much knowledge was stored in this brain to show you this is what happens at 100%. I, I can take on the whole kingdom of angels. <laughs> Adam alayhi salam. And yet, on the face of it, it's a very small brain. So, when did Allama take place? When did the knowledge process take place? After the soul was breathed into the body. How, in the three ways that we described, how did that transmission take place? Was it through an angel? No. Why? What's the pitfall in that view? If, yes? They would know what. Well, there you are. 
They would be privy to that. They would say, oh, when Allah would put the challenge, they would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, like people say, Jibreel came to the Prophet and taught uh, the Prophet. Transmission of information doesn't mean to say he's educating. Otherwise, the greatest Shaykh al would be the computer. Because it can transmit more data. If the test of uh, knowledge is transmission of data, well then your, your, your uh, uh, phones are more uh, knowledgeable than ulama. Because they have more data in it. So, it can't be the third option through a, a messenger. Min warail hijab. Can it be through that? Through, the, through a curtain? Allah gave him knowledge? Why? Be- because it's audible, but it's not uh, uh, confidential. Like Musa alayhi salam, who was the premier of this. In fact, the first person who had the privilege of audibility of uh, Allah, Kama Yaliku Shani according to Shan was Musa alayhi salam. It wasn't Adam alayhi salam. So what does that leave you? It leaves you the first option. It must have been Wahi or telepathic communication. It wasn't a case of Allah sitting him down and teaching him. It wasn't a case of him going to a course or acquiring knowledge. When the Ruh came into the body, when Allama took place, it was instantaneous. It was there. Transmission of data. Now we've reached the point where we ended last week. And now I want to give you a slight nuclear explosion here. Which I didn't give last week because I thought we had already gone on a voyage of discovery two and a half hours later. When Wahi takes place, yes. I just had a question. Yes. So you know the three ways of communication. Yes. How do we reconcile that with the night of Miraj when Rasulullah went to Islam? Yes. So which three, which of the three would that have been, or is that, would that have been a separate group? <laughs> That's a question that I used to ask as a child, ulama, and they used to sort of knock him out, and they used to, oh, we didn't, uh, we didn't see that one coming. Because on the night of Miraj, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's many answers for that. The safest answer, I'll give the safest answer, because there's dangerous answers. The safest answer is Allah Azza wa Jal describes that conversation. But to understand that, you need to understand what I'm about to say now here. Because the Quran records that conversation in which terms? The Quran says, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى He revealed on his servant whatever he revealed. It's a very polite way of saying, mind your own business. Otherwise, the discourse between Allah and His Rasul has been disclosed. But on this occasion, what happened there, mind your own... فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى The Quran says, He revealed on his servant whatever he revealed. So it was wahi. But what I'm about to make the point I'm about to make now, you won't find in tafsirs. Because it takes you to a different level of understanding. The normal rule of wahi is that a prophet expresses his thought. Allah responds. The information is revealed. The job done. Are you happy with that? I can give you examples of prophets. Yeah? Let me, let me just use the example of Adam alayhi salam. We're going to come on to this, but I'm not going to give you the detail. The latter verses say, when Adam alayhi salam was on this earth, he asked for forgiveness. Forgiveness was not forthcoming. Then the Quran says, Adamu kalimatin," And we revealed, we revealed words to Adam alayhi salam. Then he did dua. So can you see Wahi? No, there's another point I want to make here. Which is another dynamic point, because if you understand this, no one can con you the way there is an initiative to con people, that a prophet only becomes a prophet 
when he announces prophethood. That's what's said, isn't it? A prophet only becomes a prophet when he announces. Before that time, he's not a prophet. Have you heard this? This stupidity. I have no other word for it, I'm afraid. Because when you understand what Allama, Adam al Asma'a kullaha, there is no other word other than stupidity. Allah gave knowledge to Adam. What is the difference between the knowledge of a prophet and a non-prophet? What did we say in the beginning? Legal. It's legal. It's authoritative. There is no doubt in it. It is impeccable. These are the features of Wahi, are they not? So when Allah gave knowledge to Adam السلام, how did He give it? Through? Wahi. So the soul was, came into the body and it received wahi. When did Adam alayhi salam announce his prophethood? On planet earth. But he received wahi then. The question is, was that wahi as a vali or as a nabi? If it was as a vali, then it would be non-authoritative. It could be speculative. It could be prone to error. It was absolute Perfect, impeccable, wahi given. So if Adam alayhi salam, whose soul has just come into his body, can receive wahi, on what basis would he receive wahi? He must have been a prophet, even at that time. So when was prophethood given? Was it given at that time? Or was it given prior to that time? So, some people misunderstand that the breathing of the soul into Adam alayhi kama yali kushani, that was the beginning of the soul. No, 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 no. Souls existed before then. It's like your soul existed before you came into your mother's womb. The only thing that happened at 120 days in your mother's womb, what happened? What happens at 120? The soul is breathed. But who breathes the soul this time? Who? The angel. The angel breathes the soul in the womb of a stomach into a piece of meat at 120 days. It doesn't mean to say the soul was created then. The soul existed before. So Adam alayhi salam, at that juncture when the soul came into the body, it doesn't mean that's the beginning. No, no, no. You see the, the auspices. No, souls existed before then. Adam alayhi salam was a Nabi before then. So, how were souls created then? With what were souls created? Remind me of this question, we'll come back to it in the end. But I've made the point that wahi is for prophets, and Adam alayhi salam received wahi at this juncture. So he must have been a prophet. But now let's come back to that other point. Wahi is tele- telepathy, right? Telepathic reception of information. I choose my words. Telepathic reception of information. There's no external sound. There's no external volume. Only the one receiving it receives it. How? It varies from person to person. Angels also receive wahi. They receive wahi. And that's why they communicated, isn't it? On the third option. They received wahi from Allah and they communicated it. Communicated. But the principle of wahi is that it is a one way process. Are you understanding? Prophet talks, wahi comes. Prophet asks Allah, wahi comes. Wahi is not a two way process. Wahi is a one way. A prophet talks. Or asks Allah a question, or whether he asks or not, like in the case of Musa alayhi salam, they wanted to solve a murder. They went to Musa alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam went to Allah, and he was told what to do. So a question is put, dua is done, words are said, answers is, answer is given. Are you with me so far? Wahi is a 
one-way telepathic communication system where it is revealed from Allah. There's no doubt in it. This is the rule of wahi. But when it came to mine and your beloved وسلم, the rules changed. Oh, ha, ha, ha. The rules changed. Beloved, before they used to ask and I used to answer. But beloved, when you talk, your talk is also wahi. Your talk is wahi. You, your communication is wahi. Subhanallah. So before it was a one-way channel. Now it's a two-way channel. When you talk, your talk becomes wahi. And when you receive wahi, that is also wahi. That is why Allah says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ Beloved, I am aware of, I see how your eyes are fixated towards the heavens. Not because you're looking at me or you're waiting for me. You're waiting for Jibreel. You see Jibreel. For those who think that the Prophet ﷺ couldn't see angels. You see Jibreel. You know, for, for those who think that he, he was trembling when he's at the sight of seeing Jibreel. For goodness sake. Here he's in Salah and he's waiting for Jibreel to bring news. قَدْ نَرَى Indeed, for sure, sure. I'm sorry I use this language because that's to emphasize the Arabic. For sure. قَدْ نَرَى We are watching. تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ Why your face is fixated towards the heaven. You want instruction about the changing of the Qibla. But we have now changed the rules. فَلَنْ وَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا we don't care which direction anyone prostrates to us. Beloved, whatever your desire is, we will accede to your desire. Tardaha, jisse aap razi ho jaye. So the Prophet ﷺ changed his direction without wahi. Without wahi. And his action, which was without wahi, became wahi. <laughs> It became wahi. Yeah. They didn't wait for a verse to come down. That's why when a group of people, uh, when Hazrat Ibn Abbas was, radiallahu an, was walking in the streets of Medina, he saw in a house they were reading salah towards the direction of Masjid Aqsa. He didn't wait for them to end. He started talking in salah to the Imam. I mean, you imagine talking to someone in salah. You will have a word. Someone will have a word with you at the end. I mean, are you stupid? You're talking to someone whilst he's reading the Maz. <coughs> Ibn Abbas, look at this. Ibn Abbas sees a group of mu'mineen reading Salah. He doesn't wait till the end. He speaks to them. Have you not heard that the Prophet ﷺ has changed the Qibla? They didn't say, no, 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 let, let's wait for Wahi to come. Let's wait to hear wahi from the ears, eye, uh, from the blessed mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. They heard in Salah, not Jibreel, not the Prophet ﷺ, they heard Ibn Abbas and they changed their direction. Because they knew that wahi is not needed when it comes to the will and desire of Rasulullah. ﷺ. His desire is wahi. <coughs> Whatever he desire, and Allah confirms that in the Quran. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُّ Beloved, whatever comes out of your mouth, whatever you say is wahi. <coughs> Why? He attri- what is wahi? Something that comes from Allah. So he attributes... If you really want to understand Wahdatul Wujud, this is your starting point. He talks, he talks. He talks, he talks, he is he, he is he, but it is one and the same. <laughs> That's the starting of Bahadatul Wujud. Nabi ko apna khuda na manu, khuda se lekin juda na janu. Ye ahle sunnat ka hai aqeedah, nabi nabi hai khuda khuda hai. So, there are two separate entities, one is creator, one is creation. There is no uh, 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 vagueness in this distinction. One is creator and one... But, when this creation talks, the creator say, no, 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 it's not you talking, it's me talking. Your actions are my actions. Your words are my words. 
It was a one way, it was a bilateral process. Uh, sorry, unilateral process. There was a one way traffic. But when it came to Rasulullah, it was bilateral. Whatever, two way process. And then whatever the Prophet said amounted to way. That's why all hadith is a form of wahi. But then I asked this very awkward question to scholars, which they brush under the carpet. They don't answer this question. Why would Allah preserve one form of wahi, Al-Quran, with the insurance policy at the top? And the title of the insurance policy is, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. We reveal this book and we are its protectors. Quran is wahi. Well, hadith is wahi. Why didn't Allah afford the same protection to hadith as He afforded it to the Quran? The Quran in front of you, to the dot, is the same Quran. But why is it that there have been fabrications in hadith? Why is it that there have been concoctions in hadith? Why wasn't that preserved? That's another. Uh, session for another uh, another subject for another day but when i mention this to scholars they show oh no no it is protected it is protected i said no it isn't protected it isn't protected it is the subject of intellectual discourse this it's a proper knowledge the preservation of hadith and that's why when uh, 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 you sit in the company of those people the usulis the uh, uh, the real ahli hadith the real ahli, the people of hadith they, 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 they will uh, 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 grill you for quoting hadith which has an imbalance in a certain way. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Park that question for another day. What we are talking about is a telepathic transmission of knowledge. So the host has to have the capacity Of reception. If the host can't accommodate it, if a cup cannot accommodate water, what happens? Overflow. Adam salam had capacity to encapsulate the knowledge of Asma'a Kullaha. And the veracity of Asma'a Kullaha could not be accommodated by the angels. Can you imagine the seriousness of this? Anyway, I wanted to just. Uh, add more uh, meat upon Allama. I, I can carry on on Allama Adam al Asmaqullah, but let's move on. Anyway, so the competition took place, and of course, Adam al Islam demonstrated his knowledge to show that the supremacy of the human race is based upon not upon external characteristics, it's based upon knowledge, but not the knowledge that we g- grow up in, in the, of the madrasa. Where it's just copy and paste, copy and paste, and it's round around the garden. It's not, you know, it doesn't enhance your portfolio of understanding. The knowledge that is the subject of real knowledge is when you, there is no end to it. You explore and you carry on exploring. And there's no end to this exploration. Anyway. So, I just wanted to go back to that point and to elaborate a bit more. So the competition took place. Now that the competition took place and the supremacy, you see, we think that we, people I've known, have a complex. I didn't go to school or I didn't do well at school. So therefore, the door of knowledge is not for me. This is a common uh, issue I find amongst people. Oh, I can't, I've addressed this point, I can't read Arabic. So I can't enter the domain of the Qur'an. Well, that's rubbish, because if knowledge of Arabic was the uh, uh, guarantor of knowledge of the Qur'an, or the gems of the Qur'an, you wouldn't find an Arab misguided. They speak Arabic. Then I say, uh, people often say, well, I'm not the brightest of sparks. So, I'm coming, you know, Qur'an is, look how elaborate the Qur'an is. But no. When you set out on the journey of knowledge, the problem is we don't have that quest in us. We, we are bankrupt of the quest to want to know more. You know, 
I, I, I spoke to uh, uh, an alim and I said to him that on the previous occasion, I spent two and a half hours on وَعَلَّمَ Adam الْأَسْمَعَ كُلَّهِ He didn't ask me, okay, what did you say? He said, okay, so then he changed his subject. It's as if, so what? But a person who has a sense of quest, that quest is not based on what my ability is, it's based on whatever my ability is. When I surrender myself to this quest, whatever my age, whatever my intellectual capacity, this knowledge will open not only doors to me, it will open me. It will not only open doors to me, it will open me. And that's why you see that the Qur'an is the only book in the world which is the subject of memory. Why? Because it doesn't only open doors of knowledge, but it opens a person, a memory of a person. Yeah. Have you ever met someone who's memorized the Bible? Not possible. No, I haven't met anyone. But with how much ease. And when you read Surah Fatiha, or any verse of the Qur'an that you know, Look how, with how much ease it you know, oozes out of you. Yet it's a foreign language to you. Because it's the language of your soul. And you, if you were to read Salah in English, or in your native language, you wouldn't get the same uh, 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 taste as you would reciting Arabic. And there is a discussion amongst the Aimma, whether you can read Salah in your own native language, or must it be Arabic. So, uh, <coughs> um, sorry, where was I? Where did I uh, come back around? Yeah. So, we have become shy. We have become bankrupt of this quest of wanting knowledge. And for us, I'm sorry to use this language, the Quran is a dead end. We don't understand it. Or we don't want to understand it. Why? Because we think it's above us or out of our reach. But the Quran calls you, Afala yatadabbaruna. The Quran calls you, Come, I will not only open doors for you, the Quran says, but I will open you. <laughs> yes. The quest that you talk about, even the issue with the quest, the way that the Quran is taught by the Quran, is taught in a particular way, is esoteric. It's for us, and you need to just listen. Yes, but the and what ulama, that's the that uh, dialogue is the dialogue of ulama. Oh, you have to come to ulama. Of course you do. For what? You come to ulama principally for the five hundred verses that are in this Quran, and that's Sharia. Remember, we divided the whole Quran into four parts: Sharia, Tariqa, Hakika, and Ma'rifa. That's the Quran for you, in a nutshell. The problem is the scholar of today only knows Sharia. When you tell him about Tariqa, he says, oh sorry, which order are you? Nikshbandi, Shadli, Sohrwardi, that, that's not Tariqa. Tariqa, and when you understand what Tariqa is, you will understand that the majority of the content of the Quran is Tariqa. Which Sharia, which Sharia told the Sahaba that the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has turned Sharia says, when wahi comes, you oblige to wahi. That's what Sharia says, isn't it? Wahi comes, you oblige. When the Sahaba were behind the Prophet and he turned, there was no Sharia there. On what basis did they turn? It wasn't on the basis of Sharia, that was Tariqah. That was Tariqah. Tariqah says, don't wait for formalities. If your beloved goes that way, just follow him. That's what that's tariqah. And what is? Remember, do you recall the definition of tariqah? Very simple. Keep it simple. Ethics, etiquettes, mannerisms, which are not mandatory. That's tariqah. Ethics. Who al khulq? It's ethics. So. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated his khulq. And his khulq was when Sayyidina Aisha was asked, tell us about the khulq of the Prophet ﷺ, his manners, his et- 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 etiquettes. She said, khulquhu al-Qur'an. His khulq is the Qur'an. So the scholars will say, you cannot 
enter this domain without me. But that's only 500 verses. What about the rest of the verses? Yes, you need scholars to explain other verses which are non-Sharia verses. But that doesn't mean to say you can't pick up this book and explore yourself. What they say is, if you explore, you could end up in error. But I'm not asking you to, 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 to divorce the path of scholarship. Because the Quran itself tells you, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ zikr. If you don't know, or if you are unsure, or in your expedition, you should seek the uh, company of the Ahle Quran. Ahle Zikr means Ahle Quran. In kuntum la ta'lamun, if you don't know. So the principle of scholarship as Ahle Zikr, that's fine. It's fas'alu, ask. But it doesn't mean to say you are tied to and you cannot do your own explanation. There are people who have opened the Qur'an who have not been ulama, who have found great gems from the Qur'an. But we have been, I'm sorry to use this word, tuned, groomed from young age. Don't come into this arena. This is only for scholars. Scholars are authorized to give you a, an authoritative understanding of the Qur'an, which you should have. But then your quest should continue. And, and that quest can be uh, supervised by them, there's no problem. I have many people who phone me up and say, uh, I think this is deducted from the Quran. No problem, that's their misunderstanding. That's what the whole point is. You, you know, you, you ask, there's no, and there's no harm in me asking or in anyone asking. But the, 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 the culture we have today is that it's a monopoly of a certain group and that's it. But what I'm trying to say is that the quest of exploring the Quran we as an ummah are bankrupt of that quest. We don't have that desire anymore. You know, if, 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 if we announced on Wednesday night that there would be a, a, a drama series in, uh, in, 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 in Coventry, you know, and here are tickets, 20 pounds of tickets, people will pay and go. But dars e you know, people have all sorts of excuses. And it's not their fault. They've not been tuned to, 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 to this quest. That I want more. I want to know more about this, and 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 through this, I can uh, uh, find my uh, uh, the solutions to my problems. So, w- having given this knowledge, now Allah said, "Wa is wa is qulna," and again the word "wa is" is, "Oh my beloved, remember, yad kijiye ab, ya Rasulullah." Wa is wa wazkur is a hidden is a hidden fi'il in wa is wazkur. Oh my beloved, and remember, yaad kijiye, qul na hamne kaha, and this we said, this is a sign of pride. And Allah is befitting pride. Pride befits Allah. And just for your knowledge, when we were talking about osaf uh, 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 of Allah, osaf zati, osaf zati, pride is osaf zati. Only Allah. You can't be proud and say, well, I'm reflecting Allah's. <laughs> no. Pride is Allah's attribute. And that's osafe zati. Only Allah is worthy of pride. So this language has pride in it. Qulna, we said. And yet it is He alone. We said. Usjudu li Adam. Prostrate before Adam. Of course, if this order was given in this day, the first reaction would be, well, this is shirk. I mean, come on, you're prostrating towards someone that uh, I'm not going to look at your intention. That's shirk. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Can't accept that. But no, the prohibition of sajda only came about in the Ummah of Rasulullah, in the Sharia of Rasulullah. Prior to that, sajda was permissible. But only what we call sajda ta'zimi, sajda out of respect. But in the ummah, like the a, a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she prostrated to him. He didn't say, "Ah, oh, you're a mushrik. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, this is shirk. How can you do this?" He said, "What did you do?" Subhanallah. What did you do? She said, "Ya Rasulullah, in our village, we um, uh, uh, offer respect to elders by this uh, gesture." By this posture, he said, no, no. In my sharia, he didn't say you're a mushrik now, because he knew she did it out of respect. respect. 
He said, no, in my Sharia, Sajda has been prohibited, if Sajda was permissible, and the rest of the uh, hadith has been sabotaged by LGBT. <laughs> Why? If Sajda was permissible, it, a woman would be allowed to do Sajda to her husband. But in the day and age where gender has now become a serious issue, we don't know who prostrates to who, or who prostrates to what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or what. It. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. What is qulna lil malaika? And we said to all the angels, Every angel heard this order. Shows when Allah wants to communicate, there is Bluetooth, Bluetooth technology for them all to hear now. Usjudu, do sajda. Sajda ta'zimi. Li Adam, to Adam alayhi salam. When he gave the order, there was no questioning after that. They had raised their observations, they went into sajda. For sajadu, they all prostrated. There was no angel that didn't prostrate. Illa except Iblis. Aba was takbara. He was disobedient and proud. Wakana min al kafirin. We're going to talk a bit more on this later on. Let's move on. But before we just move on, Wakana min al kafirin. He became from amongst the kuffar. You see something that's come about here? If you play football, you will be from amongst footballers. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? You're not the first. Huh? They're already, they're already I think you're a bit tired now. Let me tell you a joke. It'll, it'll ease the, 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 the tension. There was a uh, a Sikh ruler uh, very in the recent uh, uh, past, his name was Raja Ranjit Singh. Yeah. And he was... He was Kana. Kana. And he was very... Uh, uh, he was very uh, cruel to Muslims. So one Fakir came up to him one day and he says, Raja Ranjit Singh, why are you so uh, against Muslims? You're mentioned in the Quran. He said, really? And he knew everyone used to call him Ghana. He said, you mentioned in the Quran. He said, me? Mentioned in the Quran. He said, yeah, show me. He said, yeah. Wakana min al kafirin. He says, bolle, 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 bolle. Kya baat hai, wah, wah, wah. Raja Ranji Singh, Wakana min al kafirin. So I just thought I'd tell you that joke just to lighten the load because I can see some of your faces. There's a lot there. Wakana min al kafirin. And he became from Muslim the Kufar. We have been taught that Satan, Shaitan, is the originator of evil. But evil existed even before Shaitan. Who instigated that evil? If Shaitan was not the perpetrator, the original perpetrator of evil, so who was the perpetrator of evil? In order to understand that, you have to understand what made shaitan commit evil. Hamzat. Hamzat. That's a very good answer. The answer is, Hamzat only exists for humans. The Hadith says, when every human is born. Yeah. Exactly. Nafs. So jinns have nafs and angels have nafs. But the nafs amara of angels is impotent. The nafs amara of an angel, why an angel cannot commit wrong. An angel does not surrender itself to desire. Angels are pure creatures. They are perfect creatures. But shaitan 
And because he was a jinn. And I know that some of Fasina has said, no, no, he was a, uh, an angel or this and that. I don't want to get into that discussion because the Quran is very simple. Wakana min al jinn. He was from uh, amongst the jinn. I, I think we don't have to labor on that. There are some who are on the periphery, or maybe not even the periphery, but there are some who have had a good you know, bash at this uh, discourse. But I think for our purposes, we can say he was a jinn who used to hang around with. Yeah, I mean, it's like a, 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 an Indian person who goes to China and gets a Chinese passport. He's called Chinese. He's not called Indian anymore. Why? Because you've got the citizenship now. There you are. So now your original status will not be looked at. You will no longer be classified as an Indian. You will be classified as Chinese. So your passport is Chinese. Yeah. Even though, of course, uh, 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 there were in the post-war migration they found a very uh, embarrassing state of affairs where people had English passports and they couldn't even speak English <laughs> and then uh, to redress that they uh, um, uh, uh, it created this law whereby you had to know a certain level of English to be to have an English passport once upon a time lawyers had the responsibility of testing that language what beautiful days they were <laughs> clients used to come to me and say you me I tell you and like, okay yes yes that's fine 70 quid that's the quickest 70 quid you're ever gonna make <laughs> one alim came to me and he said can you do one for my wife I said well where is she he said well she's not here I said, well, I've got to talk to her. He said, well, she's at home. I said, that's no good to me. He goes, come on. Just... I said, well, okay, because I really respected him. I said, can she speak English? He said, ha, wo yumi kar leti hai? <laughs> she does yumi. <laughs> bas, bas, bas. I said, the stuff. But then the home office decided, quite rightly, never trust lawyers. As Shakespeare reached the same conclusion. <laughs> Never trust lawyers. Now it's left to certain agencies. Anyway, so where did we end up on that? Where did we come from? Yeah, yeah. Nafs. He had enough on him. So the the kafirin has an in, has in it an understanding they were kuffar before shaitan, and he knew. Now let me give you a bit of a uh, uh, thing. Uh, Shaitan, or Azazil as he was then known, was amongst, he had citizenship amongst the angels. He had an angelic passport, and hence he was referred to as an angel. That reconciles a lot of the dispute between those who say he was angel and jinn. Okay, he had an angelic passport with angelic privileges. Oh yes, with angelic benefits. And he used to come on earth and fight wars against jinns. And there wasn't only jinns then. There were different offshoots of jinns. Jinns, shin, hin. Oh yes, there's different, you think there's only one sort. There's many different sorts. There's hybrids. Half jinn and half this and half jinn. And, and you think mermaids are a difficult concept to grapple. No, you just go to those countries who actually will tell you that mermaids are not a myth, they are a reality. Well, because ultimately, what is a mermaid? A hybrid of a fish and a human. And if a mermaid can exist, which of course has conveniently been brushed off in method- mythology, but if, the, if a fish can be a hybrid, then what about animals? Where did the burra come from? It's a hybrid. The Burak is a hybrid, and it doesn't even live on this earth. Anyway, let's not talk about hybrids. How did I end up here? What was I saying? <laughs> huh? yeah. So there were, different, there were different offshoots of jinns. Shin, Hin, and they used to live on this earth, and they used to fight. It was all about politics. Politics is not the invention of human beings, even though they said Margaret Thatcher was the one who invented politics. <laughs> What is politics, by the way? Very interesting question. What is politics? Uh, Lenin said, no, let me give you um, uh, Benjamin Disraeli. He said, politics is the art of who gets what, when and how. That's a very good definition of politics. Politics is the art of who gets what, when and how. But uh, Lenin trumped it. He said, Politics is the art of sitting on a greasy pole. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
you get it wrong and you know what's going to happen to you. So, <laughs> yes. What's the contents of this war that is going to happen before even... Power. Power. A domination. The law of the jungle. The earth was created for us? It was most certainly created for us, but we only populated it much later on. In its initial phase, when earth was going undergoing evolution from its different climates, ice age to this age, you think it was empty? No, even in those ages, there was creation. And that creation, it was all, even now in the world of jinns, just for your information, in the world of jinns, it's all about power. The one law, law of the jungle, survival of the fittest. The, the, the one at the top is the most powerful one. Even now, up till now. But there used to be jinn wars. There used to be wars of uh, 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 jinnad who were uh, bastions of haq. And there were those who were bastions of Batil. But Azazil used to come and fight in those wars on the side of Haq with angels. They used to fight. There used to be some serious uh, uh, um, uh, fighting that used to take place. So there were wars. It was all about power and domination. And it, some Mufassirin say that's why the angels said, well, look at these guys. They've made a proper mess up by virtue of politics. And do you think humans are going to be any different? But no, angels weren't speculating based on historical data. They knew for sure rivers of blood will flow. Because rivers of blood, blood is a property of human beings, not of jinns. Yeah. River, when they say rivers of blood will flow, they knew this refers to humans and human things. So, kuffar existed. So what took shaitan to kuffar? The same thing that took all those previous kafirs to kufr, and what was that? The nafsi ammara. So the nafsi ammara, and in its uh, in its uh, 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 state, nafsi ammara per se does not uh, 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 promote kufr. It promotes your desire, and when that desire goes out of control, that makes you prone to kufr. It makes you amenable to kufr. Okay, so. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمْ أُسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجَكَ الْجَنَّةِ And we said to Adam, O oh Adam, you and your wife, uskun, live in Jannah. Look, أَنْتَ وَزَوْجَكَ There's two here. أَنْتَ وَزَوْجَكَ Please bear in mind this digitary. You and your wife, uskun, live. So where were they before? Adam alayhi salam, where was he created? He wasn't created in Jannah. Where was he created? In the heavens? A man in the heavens? When we talk about Miraj, they say, is that possible? A man in the heavens? A mortal in the heavens? Is that possible? Adam alayhi salam was there. So Adam alayhi salam and his wife both were created in the heavens. They were created in the heavens. But then they were told, now change, now look at that, Adam, no oxygen, no spaceship, no uh, 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 cutlery or crockery for heaven, no. Humans. So humans can be configured to exist there. It's all about configuration. But then they were told there's going to be a change of residence. Yes. And you are now uskun, live. Zawjakal Jannah. Some people say that Jannah is, was part of this earth. It's a view. I'm just putting the view out there to you. Some people say Jannah was part of this earth. It was a garden on this earth. But the, not only the better view, the majority view is that actually it was actually... Jannah has many levels. Jannah has many levels. There's seven Jannahs, isn't, it? isn't there? There's Jannat Adan, Jannat Naim, Jannat Khuld. So the evidence that this was uh, uh, Jannah, as in the proper Jannah, not Earth, comes from the 
verse of the Quran. وَقَالَ مَا نَحَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمَا أَنْ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ No, not this verse. Yeah. فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهِ الشَّيْطَانِ قَالَ يَا آدَمْ هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ the, the, the tree of khuld. So this is an earth. So they were told, وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا Eat whatever you want. There's no restriction on you. Your body can sustain this food. And this food will sustain you. وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Don't eat from this tree. Otherwise you will be from the oppressors. Now, this language to use on prophets is not for appropriate for us. But Allah Azza wa Jal can use this language. There is no... I think, but for us to use this language is inappropriate. We cannot use that. You know, it's like uh, you, your father saying, Oh, I feel so stupid. I shouldn't have done that. It doesn't permit you to say, Father, you're stupid. <laughs> he'll whack you on. He'll say, How dare you... Go- you, you called yourself stupid. I'm only reiterating what you said. So this raises a number of issues here. Can a prophet become from the Zalimin? The answer is no. But Allah is saying this. But the connotation here is a wider connotation. That, oh Adam, I'm teaching your progeny. That if you disobey me, you will become from the Zalimin. So then what happened? فَأَزَلَّهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْهَا فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا مِمَّا كَانَ فِيهِ So shaitan he um, imbued within them a sense of confusion, a sense of um, forgetfulness. فَأَسَى Adam. The Quran says, and Adam forgot. Look, let me give you an example. I think it will help if I give you an example. If you are fasting, and in a state of fast, you consume a pizza. And then after you burp, you say, oh, I was fasting. Oh, I forgot. What is the law? Has your fast broken? Why? Because you forgot. There's no culpability. Yet, if you eat a little sweet piece of sweet corn and think, it's only a little. It doesn't really affect my fast. It's only a little. He ate a whole pizza and his fast isn't break. I'm eating a little sweet, sweet pea. No. Nope. What's the difference here? Intention. Fa'asa Adam, Adam forgot. When you forget, there's no culpability. But despite his forgetting, there were consequences. We cannot say there were consequences of punishment, because that's not befitting to the status of a prophet. What we say is that Allah Azza wa Jal's design was that he would be allowed to forget. But with forgetfulness, there is no, com- there is no uh, 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 um, culpability. So, then the next question that begs to be asked, what was shaitan doing in Jannah? I mean, there isn't that question across your mind? Trying his luck. Well, he's trying his luck, but I mean, come on. You have to understand, there's, there's bouncers outside of Jannah. <laughs> oh yes. You know what his name is? You don't know the bouncer of Jannah? I use the word bouncer because you'll never forget then. Ridwan. It, Ridwan. Ridwan. Oh yes. And do you know who the bouncer of hell was until he got fired? His name was Shaitan. As Azil, he was a bouncer. No entry, authorized personnel only. <laughs> and the one did not stop. 
Azazil. He had been rejected by then. فَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا فَإِنَّكَ He had already been rejected. All the, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the titles had been given to him. Get out of here. فَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا When he refused to uh, prostrate. فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ اللَّعْنَةِ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ And then he didn't stop there. He carried on his conversation. He had the audacity. He spoke to Allah directly. He had that ability to speak to Allah directly. قَالَ رَبِّ فَأَنزِلْنِي إِلَىٰ Oh Allah, give me إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَصُونَ Give me immortality till the day of judgment. Give me power till the day of judgment. Give me the, 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 the tools to do my job. And Allah gave him that tool. But, how the hell, actually I shouldn't use that word, how the hell? <laughs> how in the world did he get into Jannah? How, I mean, come on, what was Rizwan doing? The angel. I mean, it's not that he was on a break or something and he was duped. No. There was divine will. That despite the fact, now I'm going to introduce something else here. There is a hadith about Idris alayhi salam. It's a very amazing. I sometimes think Idris alayhi salam. You know, every prophet had a a a, a, um, a profession. Yeah, the most common profession, by the way, of prophets was carpentry. There you are. Oh yes, they were carpenters. What a beautiful profession. But when I read this hadith, I think Idris Islam must have been a lawyer. <laughs> he said one day, Oh Allah, I want to go to, uh, I want to see Jannah. And Allah said, Fine. Allah didn't say, well, I'm sorry, you've got to go through the whole sh- you know, spiel of going into your grave and then coming out and then day of judgment. And Allah said, Fine. Israel, take him. Israel. He's not there just for death, by the way. He does have other purposes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, of and he's a very sociable uh, angel. He's not just a, a, you know, he's not just a, a bailiff. I mean, that's just when he's on duty. He's got his bailiff hat on, but otherwise, he's a very sentimental, very, uh, you know, uh, underst- a sociable uh, uh, creature. Sometimes when he sees people, you know, uh, around the, the person dead, he looks at them and how they're behaving. He observe he observes behavior of people. Oh yes, he looks at them. They think no one's looking at us, you know, they're, ah, and they're not really crying. It's like the woman who was laughing as she entered the house of the Matam and she was like, Oh yes, he's all as soon as he entered the door, entered the door, she started crying as if someone had, you know, beaten her up. But you know, I mean this is no fake here. What was I talking about? Idris al Islam. Oh yes, Israel he's a very sociable creature, very sociable, very kind, compassionate. It's just scholars have portrayed him to be this, you know. Anyway, hadith, there's hadith there anyway. So Israel al Islam came and said, Right, let's go. So he went to the heavens, he went to Jannah. When he got to Jannah, Israel al Islam said, Right, time up, let's go back. He said, What do you mean go back? He said to Allah, Allah, you said that anyone who comes to Jannah will never leave Jannah again. <laughs> Now you know why I think he was a lawyer. <laughs> so Allah said, fine. Israel, leave him there. He said, Ya Allah, what about death? He said, for my beloved, the rules change. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, no, no, no worries. Yeah, he will die one day. Kullu nafsin za'igatul He will die. But even... Anyway, let him stay there. So according to one narration, Idris is still in Jannah. According to another narration, he's in the heavens. Well, it's one and the same, isn't it? Because uh, 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 Jannah is below the heavens. The Prophet said on the night of Miraj, I saw Idris salam. So that's an upgrade from Jannah. Where the highest Jannah is, where, that's where the uh, uh, Arsh starts. So this, anyway, so Idris salam. Once I enter Jannah, you promised O Allah, you I won't be kicked out. So how do you reconcile this with this? Shaitan entered Jannah. He could have said, right, I'm in, that's it. Done. No. It was divine will 
to allow him in, that he was winked into Jannah, let him in. But, but, his modus operandi, and I, there's another point I want to make here, which is very important, was that of deception. Why? He didn't deceive them uh, using um, elaborate uh, arguments. He just used one argument and that was enough. What was that? The Quran says, وَقَاسَمَهُمَا And he did, he did قَسَمَ of Allah. And Adam alayhi salam did ijtihad. Adam alayhi salam did ijtihad. That if someone swears in the name of Allah, he can't be lying. So Adam alayhi salam accepted his ijtihad. Yeah, you can eat from this tree. You see, ijtihad. But a mujtahid who does ijtihad and gets it wrong, does not get sin, he gets reward. And that's the status of a normal mujtahid. And anbiya, prophets, are kings of mujtahideen. Yeah. So he did ijtihad. وَقَاسَمَهُمَا He said, Allah ki qasam. I swear by Allah. This is fine. So he accepted that ijtihad. And there's one narration where he first penetrated the mind of uh, our mother, Hazrat Hamza and she then aided that process in Adam Oh yes, there's, there's much to say there. Oh yes, but I better not. Yes. So, you know, so um, forgetfulness <laughs> does that not uh, impact the uh, Isma or the Prophet? No, it's look, humans. The word human in Arabic, what's the word? <coughs> insan. And the word insan comes from two root words. Uns and nisyan. Uns means love. So wherever you will find a human, in one form or another, he will have love in him or she will have love. It's imbibed within our humanness. Even though today, now in the modern day, MashaAllah, we don't love others, we love ourselves. But nevertheless, it's love. Oh yes. When you see people's profile pictures. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we love ourselves, even though we don't say, I love myself. But you know, it's in our actions. I'm not saying there's a fatwa on people who put their profile pictures, by the way. That's quite fine for recognition purposes. But then when you add the cosmetics to that, then one wonders, is this for recognition purposes or for... <laughs> I better not say. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, what was the question again? Let's go back. Yeah. So, insan, wherever you find an insan, there's forgetfulness. But that forgetfulness is not the source. Even the Prophet allowed himself to... Subhanallah. He allowed himself to be obliged by the forces of forgetfulness. Why? Because, not because that was a human nature or human error. Not because there was a human nature or human error in that. Subhanallah. He purposely forgot in his salah for his ummah. Don't worry, when you forget, you'll still get reward. Because forgetting in Salah is the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Harisun alaykum bil mu'mineen. He was so uh, uh, concerned about the mu'mineen, he knew that they will forget in Salah. And he says, don't worry, I will forget in Salah. That is my Sunnah. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> and then the beautiful thing is, the angel writing here says, Oh, Haji Sahib only read three. He was supposed to read four. Oops. And Haji Sab is for sure, I read four. But the angel said, you read three. Subhanallah. Allah says, oh angel, what you wrote is correct. But he, his yakin was four. Therefore, I will accept his four. You see how beautiful the yakin of a human being is? Even when he for she forgets, Allah says, don't worry, I, 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 I won't. 
You know how Maghrib came about? Why is there four for Zuhur, four for Asr, four for Isha, and three for Maghrib? Why three? Where did this three come from? The Prophet didn't invent three. This three came from Ibrahim salam. He was supposed to read four, he read three. <laughs> and Allah said three will do. <laughs> Let my servants follow the forgetfulness of Ibrahim Khalilullah to show how much I love even his forgetfulness. <laughs> the sunnah of Ibrahim salam, that's Maghrib Salah. Yeah. Otherwise it was four, Maghrib was four. You see how Allah treats? Angel, I know what you've written. I know what's in your record. But he says he read four. And I say he read four. <laughs> I don't care about your record. Do you see when I said in the beginning, the shaheed of the Quran and the shuhada on the day of judgment, Allah will give credence to who? Yet they will have a forensic record. But Allah will say, no, no, no. I mean, they've said he's a good person, so take him to Jannah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to investigate forensics. That's fine. This group, Hazrat Ibn Abbas, when he used to learn of someone's death, he used to pop his head out of the window and see the people. Oh. So his servant said to him, Mawla, his servant was Mawla Abbas. He said, Sir, why do you keep popping your head out of the window when the person died? He said, because I heard that the Prophet ﷺ said that where there are 40 people who attend the janazah of a mu'min, Allah will forgive him. So I'm waiting for 40 people to attend. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't, mean to, uh, that doesn't mean to say now you wait for the whole week because you want you know, <laughs> horse and carriages. What do you want? What, I don't know. I a, you know, a, a grandfather wanted a certain you know, coffin and we, it's going to take four days to order that. No, 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 no. This is about 40 people. 40 people. The record doesn't matter anymore. The angels are told, thank you for your uh, services. What you've written is fine. But sorry, 40 people have asked for his forgiveness. And that'll do. Straight to Jannah. <laughs> Illa Dain. Except for Dain. Except for uh, um, uh, uh, debt. Oh yes. Allah likes reconciled books. Allah right, likes reconciliations. Anyway, so Shaitan came to Jannah and he used the power of deception directly and indirectly. Indirectly through Hazrat Hawa Islam. She was a soft target and he uh, 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 used her for his purposes. But anyway, the point is he was there. So th does not that raise the question? If Shaitan was in Jannah, he should have said to Rizwan, I'm not coming out now. If Idris salam, said that, why wouldn't Shaitan say that? Because Shaitan was not uh, given entrance to Jannah as a reward. It was in pursuance of trade and business. So when you are in trade and business, the door was open for you. But then this begs a very serious question, and I think we may finish on this point. Good. Why, and this relates to psychology, Shaitan is in no way, has anyone in this room seen Jahannam? <coughs> has anyone seen Jannah? No? It's all in our mind, we have Yaqeen, but it's still speculative because we haven't seen it. It's speculative from a scientific perspective, from a belief perspective, it's sure there is Jannah and Jannah, we, Jahannam and Jannah, uh, Jannah, we believe in it. But we are dealing with a person who has seen Jahannam, not only that, he was the, bail, he was the bouncer of Jahannam, and he has seen Jannah. <coughs> Can you now begin to appreciate the extent of his psychological problem? You see, if you said he had a psychiatric problem, well, then you're helping him out. It's the same language I use for Yazid. People say, he was, he was tapped. He was mad. I'm sorry, he wasn't. Because if you say he was mad, and he did what he did in madness, well, you're giving him a defense. I plead guilty to murder, but not guilty on account of insanity. You're giving him a way out. 
We're not talking about psychiatric problems, we're talking about psychological problems. A person has seen Jannah. He's seen Jahannam. He knows the consequences of his actions. But despite that, he is hell bent on his way. That's what psychology, psychology does to you. I think they call it the dark side of psychology. That's what, psycho, that's what psychological problems do. That no matter whether you know the truth or not, what prevails in your mind is that process of thinking which makes you behave in a certain way. So shaitan in no way is in doubt that he will receive punishment. But look how stubborn he is, look how arrogant he is, that despite that knowledge he says, I'm going to stick to my guns. He's not doing a, what we call a feasibility. I mean, all he needs to do is commission a feasibility study and say, come on, look, let's just assess what you're doing here. <laughs> Where is it actually going to get you? You know, all he needed to do was speak to an accountant. And he can't would have tell him, look, whatever you're doing, whatever your mission is, you can misguide all these people, but look where it's going to take you. Look where your end is. But he's willing to embrace his end, despite the fact that he uh, 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 knows. And he still carries on doing what he does. So, فَأَزَلَّهُمُ uh, shaitan. Uh, the, the verse hasn't finished here. Uh, um, would you like me to finish the verse off or shall I just... Huh? How, how long are left? Yeah, now we're working on bars. First we used to work on minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Sorry, I don't know the language of bars. Yeah. It's like in Bradford, they don't work on areas, they work on postcodes. Haji Muhammad Hussain of BD4. <laughs> if they work off post, Haji Muhammad off BD4. I mean, <laughs> that's a new one to me. So we're working off a bar system. Okay, Chalo. Right. So, uh, uh, now here, remember that thing I said, Anta wa Zojaka, you and your wife. Oh, Zoj. Oh, sorry, oops. We forgot to mention a point here, Zoj, your wife. Oh yes, wife, not partner. <laughs> not girlfriend. Wife. Marriage took place. Uh, excuse me, why do I need to get married? The law says I don't need to get married. That's the law in this country. I don't need to get married. Cohabitation can take place without marriage. Why? Because the law says. Why did he need to get married to Hazrat Hawa? Why? Because the law says. Whose law? <coughs> Whose law? Think about this carefully. For law, you need a sharia. For law, you need a sharia. Whose sharia was Adam al Islam following? Ah. Now you know why when we say that the Prophet is the Rasul, is the Nabi for the whole Alameen, it includes Jannah. Even in Jannah, marriage is a necessity. I'm sorry, even when you get there, there's no boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> marriage, oh yes, a woman will be asked. You had two, which one? Oh yes, a marriage ceremony will take place. A legal form, why? Because even in Jannah there is a Sharia. And even in Jahannam. Oh yes, it's all going to happen. But, um, so there it was, Anta wa Zawjaka. Oh, by the way, where did the marriage take place? It didn't take place in Jannah, like people say. It didn't take place in Jannah. It took pl place in the heavens. The first marriage took place in the heavens. Most marriages are heaven-based. <laughs> Cloud-based. <laughs> Cloud-based. <laughs> I don't think you're understanding cloud-based. <laughs> Maybe you should think about that. Get cloud-based. <laughs> yeah, Jello. Now they're becoming web-based. Jello. Um, so, uh, but then here, note this. In the same, in the next verse, it says, "Wakul nahbitu," and we said you should exit. Ihbit 
means you exit one. Ihbita, you two exit. This is Arabic. Ihbit, one. Ihbita, two. And Ihbitu, more than two. How much? There's no specification. But more than two. What does that mean? Ah, he had children. Oh yes. Oh yes, he had children. Procreation took place in Jannah. And there is a, <coughs> a call to the extent that actually Kabil was born in Jannah. Oh yes. He migrated from... He was a clandestine who came from Jannah. But the fact that he resided in Jannah didn't affect the choices he made when he came on this earth. Yeah. The, he had experienced, according to this call, he had experienced the purity of Jannah, but that purity did not come in the way when his nafs came in the way and said, I don't want uh, I want uh. And it was all about uh. Honestly, it was all about uh. And if it wasn't her, then we wouldn't be in that position. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, I better not go embark upon that. Uh, so, the one who lived in the land of perfection came and said, not her. And that's where the, the fight started. All over her. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It was all about her. <laughs> that was the first fight on this earth, about uh, and I use the emphasis on uh, because that's more <laughs> northern. <laughs> so, um, now all of you leave. They were exiled on this earth. Leave. Minha. And now, why was Kabil, the way he was, because of this prophecy. Some of you will become enemies of the other. Why? Based on what? Based on that word which I used before. Politics. Adu, people by their nature are pure, are kind, are considerate. But when you put politics in the equation, everything changes. That's the, adu, that's the cause, that's what the awliya say. The cause of all of these problems is politics. That we meet each other based on political. I will go and visit this person when he's poor. Why? When he's poorly. Why? Because I know him. If you say to me, go and visit Joe Bloggs in the next uh, 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 road. Well, I don't know him. On what basis would I go and visit him? Oh, hello, I'm here to... Uh, 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 visit you. So, on what base are you? Or what connection do I have with you? So, um, and you will spend a certain time on this earth. So, Adam salam started off as a couple. When he went into Jannah, there was procreation. But Jannah. And the environment of Jannah, and we'll finish on this point. Jannah and the environment of Jannah could not change the nafs of Iblis and it could not change the nafs of Kabil. Yeah. So do you see how powerful the nafs is? They say Iblis was an alim uh, only if he was also an arif. If he was an arif, he wouldn't have made a mistake, but he was just an alim, an abid. It wasn't enough. We'll just finish on there. Any questions? Um, so, I had a question. You know, for him, it's what he was saying is to a bad thing. There's some narrations around when Musa al Islam um, came across the Bedouin bush and the people, the, the people around him could hear thunder. thunder. No, no, the thunder wasn't wahi. That was just the effect. <coughs> it's like Allah says, if we reveal this Quran on a mountain, 
the mountain will crumble. That's just a byproduct of the impact of the kalam of Allah. Yes. In the bayan, you said you will talk later how well souls created. Ah. You just said that. And you that's a, that, that's uh, that's another hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but the long and short is, every matter in this universe and outside this universe ultimately was created by the Big Bang. But for science, the Big Bang is a bang. But for the literature of the Quran and Sunnah, the Big Bang is the manifestation of nur e Muhammadi Sheikh Al-Akbar Muhyiuddin ibn Arabi has written on this so extensively that you would be absolutely shocked how he writes about this. I don't normally recommend English books, but there is an English book I would recommend, even though the culture of reading is actually gone. It's called Seal of the Saints by Muhyiuddin ibn Arabi. It's a very, very uh, good book to read, and he does a whole chapter on Nur e Muhammadi in that book. Nur e Muhammadi is the source through which creation was given its form and matter. But how, when, who, why, these are details which we can talk about on another occasion. Yes? No, 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 no. We're not saying he didn't have a nafs in Jannah. He had a nafs in Jannah, but by virtue of the environment of that Jannah, that nafs was content. Because that's what Jannah does. Yeah. I mean, when the people of Jannah go into Jannah, they're still going to procreate. Oh yes, they'll have children if they want to. But it won't take a woman nine months. The process of uh, procreating for a woman in Jannah is so easy. It's like the way Hadith literature describes it. It's amazing. But um, that's if they want children. I mean, there will be people of Jannah who won't want children. Yeah. So um, the uh, 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 nafs only kicks in in an environment like this where everything is about who gets what, when and how. In Jannah, there's no need to worry about who gets what, when and how. Why? Because it's all there. Whatever you want. The Quran says, Whatever you desire there, whatever you desire, it will fulfill there. No, yes. I often ask myself this question. When you know, someone like Kabil would have been in Jannah, I mean, would he have married in Jannah? To the Hoors? Or would he? There's no firm literature on this, but it's a question. He was used to, you know, see, he must have seen Hoors or he must have. But his corruption took place on this earth. So despite an experience in Jannah, the corruption of this earth overwhelmed him. Do you see how serious this is? And Allah Azza wa is very sympathetic to us in this regard. He understands how our nafs works, that suddenly we have this urge. To be very pious and religious, and then suddenly we have this urge to do the most awkwardest of things. Allah understands that. That's why when angels were laughing at humans who suddenly turned to you know actions by virtue of their nafs, because the nafs you know does sometimes overwhelm us. Angels were laughing, and they were saying, "Look at this human! Look at the way his nafs overwhelms him." Then Allah said, "No, oh, you think it's easy." Okay, you were, he sent those angels as humans and gave them enough. I'm not going to explain the whole story. That will come later on. Yes. Was Kabila Adam in Jannah or in Sunnah? Or he was uh, in Jannah. The age is one of uh, uh, um, uh, youth, but he was born in Jannah, so there was no, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, um, a pregnancy in Jannah of Hawa Islam the way it was on this earth or the way women conceive on this earth. So you, you can't attribute uh, Kabil's uh, 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 corruption to you know, uh, 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 a difficult delivery or, 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 or childhood devastation. Or, you know, criminologists attribute crime to different factors. Kabil was, I mean, if you look at his biography, he had a 
per, the, the most desirable and perfect upbringing. His father was a prophet. I mean, what better example can you have? Your father's a prophet. Your mother is the mother of all the awliya on this earth. She was a waliya. But despite the fact that his father was a prophet, despite the fact that his mother was a waliya, corruption overwhelmed him. So if you, people think that, oh, uh, uh, um, if I find a wali Allah, that's it, I will, I'm, I'm done, I'm sorted. No. If you are a slave of your nafs, you could find the greatest wali on this earth. <laughs> it makes no difference. Why? Because your nafs is what is the problem. The problem is when we go to awliya, we want extraterrestrial powers. We want, you know, a, a knowledge of a, a, of a matter that is, is, is unthinkable. But before you get to that, before you put food in a plate, you've got to clean the plate. You don't just fill a plate without checking whether it is. So our mind, heart and soul requires purity. And that's really the ultimate objective of awliya. To, to impress internal purity within us.